Always great to worship and sing together. And uh, if you don't have it, you know what you're missing, right? Always good. Always good. It's funny, this week, you know, our preschool started here at Covenant. And uh, I came in and I was wearing my mask, this black mask thing. And I come walking in the side door. I think the kids were having lunch or something. And one of the new three-year-olds looked at me and said, Who are you? And I said, I'm Batman. He said, you're Batman? Another kid was like, he's not Batman. (laughs) Funny experiences with masks. Today's sermon is entitled, What Really Matters? What Really Matters? That word matters is thrown around a lot today. And as citizens of the United States, we all have certain rights, don't we? We have the right to the freedom of speech. We have the right to bear arms. We have property rights and the right to be considered innocent until proven guilty. Freedom of religion, other things. Uh, Because our government has stated that we have these rights, we are often very protective of those rights and liberties, aren't we? Sometimes very violently so. And yet there's a fine line between the rights that we have. Because every right has a price. Every right that you have and that you experience, every liberty has, has been bought and paid for by somebody or something. We're, our nation itself has, has, has been bought by our forefathers with the price of liberty from the tyrannical rule of Great Britain at the time. And that's when we became a nation. And throughout the years, there's been wars fought and battles fought. Uh, over those rights and, and, and keeping those rights and all the rest. So, so freedom and liberties and rights don't just happen. Uh, there, there's a, always a cost for what you receive. Um, but license and freedom to an extreme can be sin. As we've talked before, a definition that was given to me by Dr. John Oswald is, my right to my way no matter what. There's that word matter again. My right to my way, no matter what. This means that sin happens when we allow our rights and desires to exist at the cost and the expense of others. And so there's a war that sometimes rages within us and really is waging in our culture as to who has the rights and freedoms over other people. And that's why it's becoming more and more sinful. We know as Christians that Jesus paid the debt of our sin. And now the rights we experience have been paid for by the price of his shed blood. So the question that arises today is, as Christians, how do we handle situations where our God-given rights are threatened to be taken away? How do we handle that? Now we have to answer this question as Americans, right? Because that's who we are. Our culture is unique. Many other Folks in different cultures are born into situations where they don't have the same rights and freedoms as we do. And so it's a unique question uh, that we face in this country. Now, I have a disclaimer to make. I know that the, 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 the way I've presented this message thus far, far, even the title screen, seems like I'm going to give a political message. I'm not going to give a political message today, okay? I think politics really hijacks a lot of the issues that we need to discuss, They own it, they claim it, they twist it, they make it whatever it is. I'm here to tell you today that I serve one king, and he's not up for re-election this year. I serve one king, and and my loyalty and everything that I am is due to him. And so I've been very careful over the years to, to make sure that I don't push one, one political party over another or or whatever else. The only thing that I've been outspoken on is life and consistently life, and and valuing life from conception to the grave because every person's made in the image of God. And I've only encouraged you to vote for individuals who reflect God's character. That's all I've ever said. And so I want you to reassure you, if when you saw the slide and everything else, you're like, oh no, he's, I'm tired of hearing this on the news. And don't worry about it. We're going to talk about the kingdom of heaven today. Our goals and our vision is much bigger than what you're experiencing right now in our culture. If you have your Bibles, turn to Acts chapter 16. I'm going to catch you up to speed on where we are. 
Paul and Silas and Timothy are on the second missionary journey. And so they've revisited the churches that they saw on the first missionary journey, and Paul wants to go to the province of Asia. If you remember, the province of Asia isn't China or India or whatever else. It's a section within the, 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 the area of Asia Minor. And so it's actually west from where he was instead of east. And so he wanted to go there, and God said no. So he went north, and then he thought, I'll go further north, and God said no. And then he had to go west, and he went as far west as he could until uh, he came to the sea. And there he had a vision of a Macedonian man, Macedonian being part of Greece, that said, come and help us. So they crossed the sea, and they went into the territory of Macedonia and came to Philippi. And we t- remarked that uh, Philippi probably didn't have a very strong Jewish president, presence uh, because uh, they don't have a synagogue. Uh, when it came to the day of, of, of worship and prayer on the Sabbath, uh, instead of going to a synagogue, they went to the river. And at the river bank, he led his first convert to Christ, Lydia, who was a, a, a dealer in purple materials from the town of Thyatira, which Thyatira, it's always a hard word to say, is a city in the province of Asia. And so we talked about how God places people in areas and things in our heart, and yet he has a purpose and plan. And it might seem like he's just leading us in the wilderness to no end, but God's plan is always perfect. And so we left uh, Paul and Silas and Timothy in a situation where now they're staying with Lydia. They have a house to stay in. Uh, they have a woman who, who has some influence into the culture. And, and so they're set up in a great situation to bring the gospel of Jesus Christ to Philippi. Now, I'll also tell you today that um, on Wednesdays, we're doing our Philippian study. We just finished Galatians because the first missionary journey was to the province of Galatia. And I'm going to try my best to try to keep up with we, where we are in the book of Acts. But we're studying Philippians, and Philippians is a letter that was written by Paul to this very church that he's establishing now. Now, the letter of Philippians happens near the end of his life. Many believe that it's when he's in Rome, waiting his time to appeal to Caesar. Um, But I'm going to pull from Philippians as well today to really help and assist in how we're to interpret this passage. Acts 16, 16 through 21. One day, as we were going down to the place of prayer, we met a slave girl who had a spirit that enabled her to tell the future. She earned a lot of money from her, for her masters by telling fortunes. She followed Paul and the rest of us, shouting, These men are servants of the Most High God, and they have come to tell you how to be saved. This went on day after day until Paul got so exasperated that he turned and said to the demon within her, I command you in the name of Jesus Christ to come out of her, and instantly it left her. Her master's hopes of wealth were now shattered, so they grabbed Paul and Silas and dragged them before the authorities of the marketplace. The whole city's in an uproar because of the Jews, and they shouted to the city officials, they are teaching customs that are illegal for us as Romans to practice. So once again, they're heading to the riverbank because there isn't a strong Jewish presence. And and another... um, kind of evidence to the fact that there's probably not a very strong Jewish presence there is that when these guys in the end of this passage we just read bring accusation against them, he calls them Jews instead of Christians and, and kind of says they're doing practices that aren't, that are kind of forbidden for us. It's hard to know what those were. Um, uh, Jewish historians like Josephus points to the fact that there was a belief that early Christians were kind of like vampires, you know, that we talk about communion and, and, and the body and blood of Christ, and some people thought we were actually talking about drinking blood, and that freaked some people out. Uh, so, so that could be what he's referring to here. Either way, they're down there at the riverbank, and um, they're coming to this place of prayer, and this slave girl comes along, who is possessed by a demon spirit. Now, she's a well-known and respected part of that community. I know that sounds odd that someone carrying a demon spirit would be well-respected and well-known, but you got to remember we're dealing with a pagan culture here. And they believe she has the ability to tell the future, so she's a fortune teller. So people pay her lots of money to hear what she's going to tell them. And so she starts following them around saying, these men are servants of the Most High God that have come with a message of salvation. And so she's, she's sharing this truth. Now, why would a demon spirit do that? 
Why would a demon spirit speak the truth like this? Don't you think a demon would lie or try to to end whatever Paul and Silas are trying to do? And I want to tell you guys, here's a secret to the kingdom of heaven, is that God is in control. That God rules in authority and the demons can't deny it. We've seen it throughout Jesus' ministry. Every time Jesus comes into a confrontation with a demon, you know what they say? This is the Messiah. This is the Son of God who's come away, come to take away the sins of the world. And Jesus rebukes him time and time again saying, they're not ready to hear this. They're not ready to hear this. So once again, a demon is saying the truth. And it tells us, guys, that God is in authority. See, we're in this physical realm and, and partly in the spiritual realm, and so we get our, our, our focus confused. But the demons can't deny the fact that God wins. And I want to tell you, as Christians, if you've ever worried about this, demons and the devil have no authority in your life unless you let them because God is in control. And so we see in this situation that God is using a demon in a slave girl to proclaim the truth because as she's going about following Paul and Silas and screaming this out, the community that respects her and sees her authority says, huh, if this fortune teller is saying this, we better listen to these guys. You see, God can even use his enemies to bring about the goal of the gospel of Jesus Christ. He wins. Now, Paul does something curious. He doesn't deliver this woman from the demon right away. In fact, he lets this woman follow him around, which raises some pretty big questions in my heart, probably yours too if you've read this passage before. Doesn't God want us to stop slavery? Doesn't he want us to stop slavery? Slavery is bad, right? This woman is oppressed by a demon and Paul knows it. Why doesn't he set her free right away? I mean, I read a passage like this, and, and you know, social issues are very big in our culture right now and should be. Why? Why? First of all, let me just clarify something just in case you're confused. God hates slavery. God hates oppression, and he hates demonic activity. But as bad as slavery is, God did not send Paul to Philippi to abolish slavery. He sent him to Philippi for one reason. And you know what that is? To proclaim the good news of Jesus Christ. The saving work of Jesus. And so the gospel could have been lost in the midst of other causes. Of rights or freedoms. And so we need to remember that whatever causes we dedicate ourselves to this earth won't last unless it's centered in Jesus Christ. Let me tell you, whatever cause you attach yourself to, if Jesus isn't part of it, it won't last. But if you dedicate yourself to the gospel of Jesus Christ, not only will that benefit people on this short time here on this earth and impact future generations, you'll affect them for eternity. Now what's the best cause you can be a part of? Something that will last for a while and then fade away and go right back? Or something that fixes the problem all the way at the root and changes and transforms individuals. In fact, our midweek study of Philippians, Paul says in Philippians 1.10 is where we got the title of today's sermon. For I want you to understand what really matters so that you may live pure and blameless lives until the day of Christ's return. He says, I want you to understand what really matters. God wants us today to understand what really matters. We're told this matters and that matters and and this is more important than this and this person's freedom is more important than this freedom and and these people's rights are better than these rights and what do we know? What, What does matter? Paul says, I want you to understand that. He does this by explaining something that he's interacting in his own life. He talks about how he's currently in prison. And there are people that are sharing the gospel out of right motives and good intent. And there are other people sharing the gospel out of selfish ambition and vain conceit that are really kind of hurting Paul. And so he brings that up in verses 15 through 18 of Philippians chapter 1. It says, it is true that some are preaching out of jealousy and rivalry, but others preach about Christ with pure motives. 
They preach because they love me, for they know I have been appointed to defend the good news. Those others do not have pure motives as they preach about Christ. They preach with selfish ambition, not sincerely, intending to make my chains more painful to me. Let me pause there a second before I continue to read. In our culture and society, this cancel culture, right? When somebody does something with wrong motives, we feel this pressure to point them out, right? We feel this pressure to say, look what they're doing. They're, they don't, they're not doing this the right way. They're, you you got to call them out on this. you got to label them. you got to mark them. you got to make sure that their ministry is shut down and destroyed because they're not doing it the right way. And sometimes it's not even the right way. It's just not my way, right? So how does Paul handle this conflict where some have good motives and some have wrong motives, even motives that hurt him? The next verse, verse 18, but that doesn't matter. Whether their motives are false or genuine, the message about Christ is being preached either way, so I will rejoice and I will continue to rejoice. What he tells us in this passage is what really matters. You know what that is? That the saving message of Jesus Christ is preached. He's laser focused on that. His whole life, his purpose, everything that he does, every cause, is, every drive is about the gospel. He says that's what matters. Not what your motives are, not, not how purely it's done, but the message is preached. So he keeps his focus on what really matters. And so not that slavery isn't wrong or that this woman shouldn't be delivered from the demon. Those are situations where people are in bondage and have their rights taken away, and it is wrong. But what matters most is that the gospel is preached and lived out and changed lives. In fact, Paul believes in this so much so that he's willing to have his own rights taken away in order for others to believe. I also need to point out the fact that every time in Scripture we see somebody delivered from a demon, they're either asked for it, or somebody brings them to them and says, please deliver them. There's no indication in this text that this woman wants to be delivered from a demon. But I want to tell you that what we see here in this passage is that Paul isn't fighting the battle of slavery or this woman's demon possession first because it's all about the gospel. Yes, those are causes that that should be spoken up against and all the rest, but there's a higher calling, a higher cause, and the really way to battle those things is to deal with the deeper issues of the heart. And Jesus, the world can't look like Jesus if they don't know who Jesus is. And that's the heart of this message. He is willing to have his own rights taken away. But before we get to that, Paul delivers this woman from the demon. Not because he was sent to do so, and not because she isn't proclaiming truth. He gets annoyed with her. (laughs) Isn't that funny? I mean, I think that's kind of funny. I've got a little bit of a dark humor here, but you're annoying me. Stop it. Get out of her. But when we really look at the passage, it was fine that that demon was proclaiming truth because that was preparing people's hearts for for hearing the message of the gospel. At this point, it's become a hindrance. You won't stop shouting and people can't hear what i got to tell them. Stop. Get out of her. So the gospel can go forward. The gospel is what matters most. And as soon as anything becomes a deterrent to the gospel in Paul's life, that's when he exacts change. Now the slave owners are angry because they've lost their ability to get an income off this slave girl. And they come to the authorities with some trumped-up charges against Paul and Silas. They say the city's in uproar against them. It's not at this point. It's about to be. And then they say they're pushing these customs on them. So let's see what happens next. Verses 22 through 24. A mob quickly formed against Paul and Silas, and the city officials ordered them stripped and beaten with wooden rods. They were severely beaten, And then they were thrown into prison. The jailer was ordered to make sure they didn't escape, so the jailer put them into the inner dungeon and clamped their feet in the stocks. Let me just pull back. I'm sure most of you have heard this passage before, 
But let me just kind of look at things from our perspective today a little bit. What did Paul and Silas do that was so wrong? They just proclaimed truth. They delivered a woman from a demon. They hindered this woman who's a slave from her masters taking advantage of her in a certain way. They've kind of made her worthless in a sense to them. Maybe even leading eventually to her freedom. It sounds good to us, right? And yet here they lose their rights. And so the question rises, don't Christians have rights too? It's not fair. They're stripped. They're beaten. They're thrown into the center cell, the highest security in the dungeon. Their feet are put in stocks. Don't have Christians have rights too? And, And that's the question I posed at the beginning of the passage. What do we do when our rights as Christians are threatened? Should we stand up and say, hey, what about me? Should we, should we fight and, and make sure people, we keep our standing in the community and people know what we're about? And, and, and should, should we just get angry and upset and put up our fists and raise our arms and all the rest? Hmm. Where is the mob to defend our rights against the mob that took it? And I think that's how many folks would look at this situation today. I know that's how the world looks at it. How dare you take my rights away when I'm part of a just cause benefiting those less fortunate to me? But let's look at how Paul and Silas handled it. Verse 25. Around midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God, and the other prisoners were listening. Are these guys crazy? I mean, I just have to ask the question. Are they crazy? I mean, most people that have been beaten senseless thrown into the center cell, no promise of ever escaping, having their feet in stocks. Scripture doesn't say it, but they might still be up at midnight because they're in so much pain they can't sleep or can't get comfortable. Are they crazy? Let me reassure you that they're not. They did not come to defend their rights or the rights of anyone else. They came to share the gospel. And they've been wrongfully accused, beaten, and imprisoned which gives them now the opportunity to exemplify the very message they preach, the sacrificial love of Jesus for everyone. What do I mean by this? What is the gospel? The God of the universe loved you and me so much that he took our punishment and our penalty upon his body. He was wrongfully accused. He was beaten. He was stripped naked and put on a cross. He died for your sins and my sins. It's one thing to say it. It's another thing to live out the testimony before others. And so they're saying, wow, we get to look like Jesus to these people. We get to prove what we just said. Woo! Worship time. This doesn't make sense, does it? Your rights, your freedoms have been stripped away. And they say, we don't care. Philippians 1, 28 and 29 says, Don't be intimidated in any way by your enemies. This will be a sign to them that they're going to be destroyed, but that you're going to be saved even by God himself. For you have been given not only the privilege of trusting in Christ, but also the privilege of suffering for him. He sees this moment of persecution where his rights are stripped from him as a privilege. Not a punishment, but a privilege. How backwards is that? No, it's not backwards. That's the right way. The way of the cross. The way of faith. And so, he's saying, and they're thinking, those that threw us in here thought they would break our spirit and put us in our place. They thought they were taking something away from us that we couldn't get back. Oh no! No, they didn't take anything away from us. They just gave us a different opportunity to testify and live out the testimony we had just given them. And that's what Paul says here in Philippians. Don't let your enemies intimidate you. Because when they can't break your will, when they can't break your heart, and they see you living for something more, it's more reality to them that there's something wrong with them, and you got something right going on. Their abuse and imprisonment have furthered the gospel message 
and enable them to live out before the lost. They're accomplishing what really matters, and that's why they're having a worship service in jail. Instead of claiming their rights or demanding respect, they're willingly giving them up so other people can see Jesus. And the gospel is the greatest cause in the world. So God calls us to spend more time being willing to give up our rights and freedoms than to demand demand those rights and freedoms for ourselves and others. I'm sorry, folks. As Christians, that is our calling in our culture. To be willing to give up our rights and freedoms for the sake of the gospel instead of demanding our rights and freedoms for ourselves and others. There's a higher purpose, a higher calling, something that really matters. Verse 26 and following. Suddenly there was a massive earthquake and the prison was shaken to its foundations and all the doors immediately flew open and the chains of every prisoner fell off. The jailer woke up to see the prison doors wide open. He assumed the prisoners had escaped, so he drew his sword to kill himself. But Paul shouted to him, Stop! Don't kill yourself! We're all here! The jailer called for lights and ran to the dungeon and fell down trembling before Paul and Silas. Then he brought them out and asked, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? They replied, Believe in the Lord Jesus and you'll be saved along with everyone in your household. And they shared the word of the Lord with him and with all who lived in his household. Even at that hour of the night, the jailer cared for them and washed their wounds. Then he and everyone in his household were immediately baptized. He brought them into his house and set a meal before them, and he and his entire household rejoiced because they all believed in God. Can you imagine what that breakfast tastes like, huh? God is in control. We say it all the time. You probably said it multiple times this week. But do you believe it? See, them being in this prison and this situation was undeniable. Remember, he wanted to go to Asia. God said, no, I want to go north. No, has a vision of this Macedonian man. Come, come, help us. He goes. Just happenstance to meet Lydia at the river. She gets saved. Things are great. They deliver a woman from a demon possession, end up in prison. Well, this must be where God has me. There's no denying that God is in control, but he brings things to fruition in his timing. And so he has a plan. And so while they're in there, they have, forgive the dad joke, they have a captive audience, right? They're ministering to people where otherwise they'd never have the chance if they weren't beaten and wrongfully thrown into prison. You've got to realize every opportunity that God gives you in your life, whether you like it or not, is an opportunity that God is bringing you around other people that need to hear the gospel. And so these other prisoners are hearing this worship service and this prayer service, and they're like, wow. And it's so impacting on their life that when this supernatural earthquake happens, that their jail cells fly open and all their chains fall off, they don't leave, they stay. Because the freedom they have in Jesus is greater than any other freedom they'll receive in life. That is why the primary cause of our life as Christians has to be the gospel. Because any other freedom we offer people will not satisfy them. We look at each other and say, well, if I had their life, if I had their standing, if I had the respect they get, then I'd be happy, then I'd be content, then I'd be fulfilled. No! No! It's better to be in prison with Jesus than to live in a mansion without him. That was the reality Pharaoh uh, realized. I love the, sounds bad, I love the plague. I love, I love the imagery of the plague of darkness, right? Where darkness covers all of Egypt except for the land of Goshen. And I wonder if Pharaoh in his palace looks out the window, you know, if they had windows, or or on his porch, because he probably had the highest place in the capital city, and he looks out and sees a glowing light in the distance. There is light. Where is that? It's a slave encampment. See? Whole different perspective. Freedom in Christ is more valuable than any right or freedom we can have on this earth. And as a result, this jailer and his whole family come to the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. Now, what I'm about to tell you, I cannot substantiate. I don't know. But I wonder if when Paul prays this sinner's prayer with this jailer and leads his family to Christ, if he looks on this jailer's face as he sees the freedom and deliverance and realizes, that's the man I saw in my vision. 
That's why I'm here. He was the Macedonian man. Because again, if he hadn't been in that prison, he would have never had that opportunity to reach the jailer and his family with Christ. Verse 35, the next morning the city officials sent the police to tell the jailer, let those men go. So the jailer told Paul, the city officials have said, you and Silas are free to leave. Go in peace. Yay, let's get out of here. Run. But Paul replied, they have beaten us without a trial and put us in prison, and we are Roman citizens. So now they want us to leave in secret? Leave secretly? Certainly not. Let them come upon themselves. Come, let them come themselves to release us. When the police reported this, the city officials were alarmed to learn that Paul and Silas were Roman citizens. So they came to the jail and apologized to them. Then they brought them out and begged them to leave the city. When Paul and Silas left the prison, they returned to the home of Lydia. There they met with the believers and encouraged them once more. Then they left town. Have you ever wondered why Paul and Silas did not claim their Roman citizenship to to begin with? I mean, they were Roman citizens. That doesn't mean much to us, but let me explain a little bit what that means. You were either born into Roman citizenship, you had to earn it and buy it, or someone of great authority had to give it to you. And Roman citizenship meant that you could not face any punishment without a fair trial. And if you faced punishment, there was a limit to how far they could punish you. Like being on a cross was not something under a Roman citizen could die of. Okay, So, so that's the situation we're in. If you and I were in Paul's shoes, we definitely would have claimed it. Most likely, right? Hey, wait, wait, wait. I, I've got a I get a get out of jail free card. I played in Monopoly enough times that I know exactly where that card is. So if I get on go, go to jail, I know I'm not missing a couple rounds. I'm out, right? They have a get out of jail free card and they don't use it. Why? Why? Hmm. What really mattered? What really mattered? Hmm. Most of us, if not all of us, would have used that card, but Philippians 1.27 explains what Paul's perspective was. Above all, you must live as citizens of heaven, conducting yourself in a manner worthy of the good news about Christ, and whether I come and see you again or only hear about you, I will know that you are standing together with one spirit and one purpose, fighting together for the faith, which is the good news. Guys, the end of this passage is what the church needs to be. There are too many of us fighting with other believers around the world on these issues and causes because we have the same heart for healing and reconciliation, but two different ways to go about it. We have homes being divided between believers because one pulls one direction and one pulls the other, and this should not be so. Do you know how we can be strongly unified and be a, a, an army together against this sinful world? is we get laser focused on what matters most. And that's the gospel of Jesus Christ. And Paul says we do this because our citizenship is in heaven first. And so I want to tell you that you are not Americans first when you gave your life to Christ. You're not West Virginians. Your last name no longer defines who you are in your character. All those other loyalties that you have are secondary or obliterated completely. You are citizens of heaven. And that should be the driving force in your life. That's why he doesn't claim his Roman citizenship. I don't think it's because he forgot it. I think it didn't matter to him anymore. In that situation where he was brought before those authorities, he didn't claim it. Because for the gospel to go forth in the most consistent manner, he was willing to face abuse that he didn't have to so that more people could hear about Jesus. His citizenship with heaven was what it was all about. So why does he pull the card now? Why does he say, wait, wait, wait a second, we're Roman citizens? Well, <clears throat> to be honest, because they were wrongfully beaten and abused, he can, he can get these guys a, a severe reprimand. These leaders in Philippi can lose their positions. 
They could even face some, some consequences themselves, possibly be even thrown into prison because they did this to a Roman citizen. And they're fearful of that. Again, in our culture, our cancel culture, isn't that what's happening all the time? If we find out that anybody has ever made a mistake before in their life, we're like, we got to help let people know. You squashed this person's rights. You said this. You did this. And we make them pay. But does Paul claim his Roman citizenship in order to make these people pay for what they did to him? Nope. He just says, I'd like an escort. I pulled my Roman citizenship card for one reason and one reason alone. So the whole city of Philippi can see you leading us out. Why? Because it left the whole community with this question. What would cause a man to give up his special rights willingly, especially if it meant abuse and arrest? It benefited the gospel of Jesus Christ, the good news, at this moment for him to pull the get-out-of-jail-free card because it raised the question. And they now had the authority of the city officials saying, we've wrongfully touched these guys. They should have freedom to go and do and say whatever they want. What could cause this? And the answer is Jesus. Our battle, which should unify the church and give us purpose, is the good news of Jesus Christ. We need to stop being divided on other causes that don't get to the very core of the problem and the heart of the issue. Now, don't hear me say that you shouldn't be against human trafficking. And you shouldn't be against uh, racial equality. And I, I, I mean, you shouldn't, yeah, you shouldn't. I'm, I'm saying you should be part of all these good causes. But whatever cause you're a part of, make sure that the center of it, your laser focus, is always on sharing the good news of Jesus Christ. Because if it's not, then it creates division. It will. And so you've got to remember that. No laws, no regulations or orders or commands can change the human heart. Jesus is the reset button. That's how we get born again. That's how we get made new. Let me finish. Just in case you're in this room and you're like, you've mentioned the gospel and you've mentioned the good news and I don't know what that is. Maybe you're watching online right now and you're saying, I'd just like to know what he's talking about. Let me tell you what the good news is. When God created this world, this earth, it was everything he designed it to be. There was no death, there was no suffering, there was no pain. It was all good. It's everything we've ever dreamed about. And one of the last things he created in this earth was us, unique in all his creation. We were made in the image of God to share his character. We had the ability to love. We had the ability to choose. We were self-aware, and he gave us the ability to, to, to manage his creation. He, he kind of said, here's everything. It's all mine, but would you take care of it? And we said, yes. And he said, there's one rule. One rule. You can enjoy any of the, of the plants and the vegetables and the fruit. You can eat it all, but there's one tree, one plant you can't eat from. He set a stipulation. We broke the one rule. We did our own thing. And because we are managers of this world, it allowed sin to evade and affect all of this world. And that's why we have natural disasters like the hurricane down south. That's why we have thistles and thorns and pain and cancer and death and all the rest. It's not because God doesn't love us. Oh, he loves us, but we wrecked his good earth by our choices. And so every single one of us around the world, we're not born naturally good. We're born with a, a, an intent to do things our own way that leads to death and destruction and hurt and pain. And the ultimate consequence for all of us is death and eternal separation from God. Death and hell. I know it's not popular to talk about hell, but let me be clear on hell. Hell is a real place. It's not fun. Don't believe ACDC. They don't know what they're talking about. It's a real place, not designed for you and for me, but for the devil and his angels. And the only way we end up in hell is if we choose to go there. But the rest of the story is human history, the Bible records this, and all other forms of human history you'll ever find points to the fact that we can't fix ourselves. There have been people that have tried to earn enough money, 
enough power, enough fame, enough recognition to somehow defy death, and it doesn't work. The Bible even records that the best of men and women fail to conquer death. And so there's this chasm, this gap between who God designed us to be and who we really are. And we're all stuck here. And we can't fix ourselves. And we can't fix the world. And it just gets worse and worse and worse. And yet God said, I love my creation so much, humanity, that I'm going to bridge this gap. And so he came as a human being, fully God and fully man. And he lived a life among us without sin. And he gave and bought our freedom and bought our rights in Christ by dying our death on a cross that he did not deserve It wasn't right, and it wasn't fair, and it wasn't good. But he died our death for us. And the only way that we get saved, free from the the consequence of sin and hell, is the same thing Paul told the jailer in that moment when he asked, what must I do to be saved? Paul said, believe in Jesus. You have to believe that he exists. You have to believe that there's a tomb in Jerusalem today that has no body in it because Jesus is the only one who's ever conquered death, the common denominator in all of humanity. Believe and then live with him. See, when Jesus saves you, literally saves you from the fires of death, he doesn't just save you, he changes you. He makes you a new person. That, that sinful heart that's in you, he removes it and gives you a new heart that desires to do good things. And because he's alive, you walk with him every day. The Bible, he speaks to us through the Bible. He tells us who we are. And you've got to believe who he tells you who you are. And as you do, he pours love into your life and it just flows out to others. And before you know it, all these social issues that we want to change in the world, it just flows out of you because you are all those things you want everybody else to be. And then you live a life transformed. And then one day, when your life ends on this earth, unless Christ returns, you'll wake up not in the flames of hell, but in the home of Jesus. And you'll live forever with him, with a new body that won't get hurt and won't perish. No more sorrow, no more tears. And every person that you share this good news with, that believes as well, gets to be an adopted son and daughter just like you, and they get to spend eternity with you. That's why the gospel, the good news, is what matters most. Because everyone, everyone who believes can receive it as well. No other message we can deliver. I, I was telling somebody in first service, my lawnmower's been busted for like a couple months now. I know it's bad. And thankfully, my neighbor's been letting me borrow his mower, but his mower broke the other day too, and he lost a wheel on it, and so we're both out of luck. But I said, it's it's like having a busted lawnmower, and I go to fix it with my son's plastic tools. I'm not going to get very far. When we attack the causes and problems in this world without making Jesus and the gospel the center of it, we might as well have my, my son's plastic tools for the job. But when you have the gospel, you have the life-changing reality for all of humanity. And so that's why we stay focused on that. I know it's kind of rote. People roll their eyes when you say, what's the answer to the problem? You say, Jesus. They're like, oh yeah, I know that. Do you really know that? Because if you really knew that, you would be free. You would be transformed. You would be changed. You would have everything in him. I wasn't sure I was going to share this, but I'm going to share it. Mark mentioned the, the Republican National Convention earlier. Uh, one of the families they interviewed was a mother and a father of Kayla Mueller, who was um, helping children in an orphanage in India and then was taken by ISIS in Syria and um, was in a 12 by 12 cell where she was beaten and tortured and raped for 18 months by her captors. She's a believer. She wrote when she was in India this. She said, I find God in the suffering eyes reflected in mine. I always seek God. Some people find God in church. Some people find God in nature. Some people find God in love. I find God in suffering. I've known for some time what my life's work is, using my hands as tools to relieve suffering. She, God had spoken that to her heart. And then when she became a prisoner by ISIS, 
Another prisoner snuck out this message that she had written that said, I have been shown in darkness light. I have learned that even in prison one can be free. I have come to see that there is good in every situation. Sometimes we just have to look at it. Now, is she crazy? No. Even though she died in that 12 by 12 cell, and they still haven't recovered her body, she understood that a life well lived is living the gospel in the community and the people that she's around. I guarantee that she shared the gospel with her captors even before they took her life. She kept the right perspective. Folks, Kayla lived a life that God's designed for all of us to have. And we've got to get center focused on what really matters. Lord, I, I pray today for uh, those that are in this room and those that are streaming online. And God, there's so many good causes, so many battles to fight in this world. But God, we got to fight it in the only way that will win for all of eternity. And that's by sharing what you've already done. There is nothing that we can do that can atone for sin. There's no kind of reparation that we can make that can make all the sinful things done in our nation right or done around the world right or done in our hearts right. We can't. We're incapable. And yet we know that the shed blood of Jesus Christ 2,000 years ago did all of that. So forgive us, God, for trying to heal the, the wounds of the world without keeping the clearest picture of all, that you've already done it. You've already paid the debt. You've already crossed the chasm. Salvation is available to anyone who will believe. They're just calling out like that Macedonian man, come and help us. God, we have the message of life, the gospel. Help us to get that center focus as Paul did, that, that whether it means claiming our rights so the gospel can go forth or laying our rights down for the gospel to thrive. God, let us follow you, Jesus, wherever that might be. Paul identified himself as a slave of Jesus, one who's laid every right and obligation aside and claims only what Jesus gives him. Let that be us today, slaves of righteousness that say, you're in charge, I'm not. I'll go wherever you take me. God, for those who are hearing this message and, and haven't believed in you, they aren't saved. And they're, they're realizing, I need Jesus today. I pray for them that wherever they are right now, whether in this room or online, in their seat, that they would ask you to be Lord and Savior. If you don't even know how to pray, just, just pray this prayer with me. Jesus, I know that I can't fix myself. I've tried, I've failed, I can't be good enough. All my best intentions just get wrecked. And now I see what really matters, and that's you, Jesus. I don't know why you would love me. I don't know why you would give your life for me, but I have heard today that you've already done it. My debt has been bought and paid for, and I want to have freedom and life and a new heart and a new way of doing things. And so today I choose to believe in you. Forgive me of my sins. Don't give me the consequence of my action. Give me a new life and a new heart. Let me live for you. I don't want to end up in, in hell and separated from the God that created me and loved me. I want to know you every day on this life, in this earth, and I want to spend eternity with you. So just as I am, Lord, I come to you. Save me. Your word tells us, Jesus, that if we confess our sins, you are faithful and just and will forgive us of our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So whoever prayed that prayer today, let them know in the core of their being that they are now your child, fully adopted, just as if they were born to you. They are now born again. <sighs> Bring a great awakening around the world, Lord. Start with us. In your name we pray. Amen. I invite you to come.
Just come. Whatever you're going through, whatever you're facing, I think part of this message for us is going to be reconciliation with our brothers and sisters in the church. We've been pointing fingers at each other long enough, saying you haven't been doing enough, or you're not standing up, or you're not speaking 